Okay, as, as everybody saw the, the movie, The Blood at the Doorsteps, with the, all of the family with uh, Dante Hamilton. And we want to talk just briefly, and we won't keep you long, but we want to talk a, a little bit about some of the things that was mentioned in the, in the movie. And as you did see, uh, the quote by James Baldwin when he said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So I think I'll start with Lexi. Lex, uh, what are your thoughts uh, when it was said in the documentary that the officer made an error in judgment? Okay, and thank you Utah Film Society for having me and thank you Jeanette Williams, she's the president of the NAACP and thank you Heidi for coming. Um, the officer absolutely made an error in judgment. He practiced zero de-escalation training. Dontre was unarmed. Um, when someone has mental illness, you need to practice de-escalation training. That was not used. Um, and the fact that he tried to sue the police department because he received a disability for killing an un unarmed black man is, is ridiculous, sad, and disgusting. Um, he's a murderer, and he, you know, he deserves to rot in prison for the rest of his life. Thank you. Thank you. And when Lex talks about de-escalation, de uh, we look at verbal de-escalation uh, is what we use um, during a potentially dangerous or threatening situation in an attempt to prevent a person from causing harm to us, themselves, or others. Uh, without specializing training, we should never consider the use of physical force. And so I'm going to ask Heidi uh, if she wanted to talk about de-escalation because I know we've been talking about that for a while with the Salt Lake Police. Yes, we have. Uh, de-escalation, it's all about communication and effectively communicating. And if you can't effectively communicate, you back up, wait for more backup, and not pull out your gun to end the problem. The gun is a short, quick resolution to end what the responsibility of a police officer has, which is to handle the situation and either bring the person to jail or make the decision that they need help if they have um, mental health issues. And of course, um, I'm up here because unfortunately I lost uh, the life of my loved one, James Dudley Barker, who was shot and killed. Um, a lot of you might have heard of that. It happened June 8th, 2015. And, um, you know, James was a beautiful soul and he was a kind soul. And if you watch the body cam footage, you can see him being very calm and kind when the officer is asking him what he's doing. But it quickly escalated. And it escalated because. The officer did not practice de-escalation. He did not use the CIT training. So James is dead because of that today. And I am here, and we are all here, because I don't want to see anyone else to go through what I had to go through. I don't want anyone to go through this, to wake up and find that your beloved is gone. So. Thank you. Thank and real you, quick. Heidi. It should be noted that Heidi brought Arbinger training to Salt Lake PD, so now every Salt Lake PD police officer has to receive Arbinger de-escalation training, and that is because of Heidi. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we suggested it. Um, uh, someone who was James's good friend uh, knew someone who owned the training of Arbinger, and the, the police picked up the ball, and they did it, and it was, just to show that you need to face something in order to change it. Thank you. Okay, we want to move on, talk a little bit too about the uh, PTSD because they mentioned that in the movie. Uh, and one of the things that I was doing when I did a little bit of research, and it's noted that people with untreated mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter than other civilians approached or stopped by law enforcement. And this was according to a report 
released by the Treatment Advocacy Center. And then I want uh, Lexi and, um, I'm sorry, Heidi, Heidi to um, talk about the PTSD uh, as a mental disorder and what people need to know about it. As far as um, officers having PTSD? Well, with uh, citizens having PTSD and officers needing to uh, know the symptoms when they see it and, and maybe even uh, head trauma. Absolutely. Um, uh, James had a TBI that he was recovering well from. Um, he was on medication. Um, but yeah, PTSD, I, I believe officers need to be trained to recognize signs and symptoms when things are off and open that window that, you know, hey, this person might be having trouble today. But along with PTSD, there's so much out there today as far as pharmaceutical drug withdrawal or also um, people who are just starting medication, who are not taking medication correctly. Um, there is such a large spectrum that you can categorize mental health issues under these days. And it could be anything from um, a woman who's having uh, postpartum. It could be hormonal. You know, the list goes on and on and on. But I also don't want to excerpt is that also we have to think about officers who, have, who are military. And there is an issue that our police are becoming more militarized. And that is because people who are in the military receive extra points on their entrance exams for becoming police officers. So they're given an advantage. But when they are in police um, employment, sometimes officers are afraid to admit that they have PTSD. So this is also an issue we've discussed in our meetings. And it's a, a very serious one. So yeah, there's a lot to improve on. Okay. Uh, we want officers to treat everyone the same. We want de-escalation training to be used. We want two officers on the scene at every call. Salt Lake PD is now doing that. Um, they're calling mental health counselors to the scene. Um, but we also, you know, it should be taken into note that they aren't doing this. Suicide by cop is a regular thing. We've seen it this year so far, twice. Um, someone wants to commit suicide, they call the police, they say they have a hostage, they, you know, and the police come. And so, you know, Black Lives Matter, we would like the officers to all have diversity training, de-escalation training, diversity and hiring practices put into place. Um, we want, U Utah Against Police Brutality has written a piece of legislation called the um, community, ooh, what's it? The SLC PAC is the PAC that includes all of us, but it is basically for a community controlled civilian review board that has the power to bring charges against police. That is what Utah Against Police Brutality is doing. Black Lives Matter is writing the Police Accountability and Transparency Act, which um, would enforce that every police officer is drug tested for steroids. They all have to receive diversity training, uh, de-escalation training, um, CIT. CIT. If a police officer is fired, they can't be rehired by another police agency. And so we're done talking about if there's a problem with police brutality, we are going to solve it. We are no longer going to be hunted. We have become the hunters. We are not going to tolerate this anymore. And if someone does have PTSD, whether it's the police officer, and, and police that have PTSD, we addressed this in our last CAG meeting. Um, are they receiving the training? Are they getting the help that they need? You know, because if an officer with PTSD meets a criminal with PTSD, what are the circumstances? We saw what they did to James Parker, you know, and his mental, and he was, had some mental disabilities. Absolutely. And they just pull the trigger and they murder us. And so um, we need to look at this from every angle and have them stop killing us. Okay, thank you. One of the things that you might have noticed in the beginning, it was uh, it all started at a Starbucks, 
And <laughs> of course, so we know recently what happened with the two realtors sitting in the Starbucks in Philadelphia. And today, all of the Starbucks were closed uh, for diversity and sensitivity training. Yep. And, and that was through the NAACP, the NAACP. And so we want to look at explicit biases uh, when we look at things like that. And because they didn't just, Starbucks didn't just say, oh, this happened to the two realtors. Let's have this diversity training. It, it started with some of the other incidents where they've called police and one being in the, in the uh, film that you just watched uh, uh, with Dante. And so then all of a sudden this happened with the realtors. Um, they're getting a bad name for a Starbucks and so they wanted to make sure that they put a stop to it. So this is one of the ongoing things that happened. And so we talk about the uh, unconscious biases and what it says is that your, back, your background, your personal experiences, your stereotypes, all of those things go into when people have explicit biases. And we see these happening all the time. And what I would ask for uh, both Heidi and Lex to talk about uh, some of the times when they see that maybe police officers may have explicit bias our unconscious bias. Um, white police officers kill black men every 28 hours in this country. Black people are pulled over at five times the rate of white people. Um, we're given higher sentences for lesser crimes. That was filmed in Milwaukee. Milwaukee has the highest black detention rate in this country and the highest recidivism rate, okay? There are more black men incarcerated in Wisconsin than are free. Um, David Clark is Wisconsin, right? I don't know, I think he got fired hopefully, but um, I, I run the United Front Civil Rights Organization, it's a national organization. I am so sick of hearing about the racism that comes out of Wisconsin. But what we see from white police officers is that, you know, obviously they can catch a white mass shooter who just murdered a whole bunch of people alive right? But they can't capture a unarmed black man like Patrick Harmon alive. Um, so we're seeing them murdering black people at a higher rate than white people. We're seeing them profiling us, arresting us, and brutalizing us. And it is because of implicit bias, especially in Utah, where it's 2% black. Um, we're seeing a lot of racial profiling here, even though we're only 2% black. So, yeah, we, we see a lot of racism in policing. And can I add something real quick? Yes. Um, we really, really want to push for diversity in hiring so that not every police officer you see is white. Amen. <laughs> we want it to represent community, and we want diversity to reflect in our officers. And, and that's and that women so and true. men. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, women and men officers. We believe it can be done. Yes. Yes. And that's one of the things that maybe the audience can help us with, too, because if you know people that are looking for employment, uh, have them contact some of the police departments, and, and let's get some diversity in there. Uh, one of the things I think Heidi mentioned, and then it was mentioned in the, in the film, too, about the CIT, which is the crisis intervention training, and I know that the Salt Lake and West Valley and some of the other uh, departments are putting those, uh, those programs in, into play. And what that is, it's a model program for community policing that brings together law enforcement, mental health providers, hospital emergency departments, and individuals with mental illness and their families to improve responses to people in crisis. And so this is what uh, is needed, is that an officer, as the film said, the officer walked up to uh, Dante and, and touched him. And as the one um, officer said, the, the sheriff, I guess, said the, um, that you never to do that. Don't touch the person. So there's a lot of things that the um, CIT program and the training will teach officers. And uh, from my understanding is that they're going to be doing like at least a 40 hour uh, training for every officer on that. 
And so I don't know if there's somebody want to say something about that. Yeah, yeah, we need more training on that. 40 hours is not enough. Um, we would hope there would be yearly training, uh, yearly required, like CEUs. Uh, many professionals out there, like doctors, um, therapists, uh, massage therapists, need to take ongoing CEU credits. I think it should be the same um, with the mental health because it's so prominent in society and police really need to reinforce it over and over again with the training. That same true. Okay, good. One of the things that uh, I know that we've talked about in the past too is making sure that these cases are recorded and so people know uh, and they can't just say, oh, well, we thought that person had a, a mental illness or they were behaving uh, strangely, but we want to make sure that people know. And just like Dante's mother had said, that she had noticed that her son was acting uh, like something was wrong with him, he was hearing voices. And, uh, but they didn't really go out and get the necessary treatment that he needed. And so we want to make sure that families know uh, the different signs and that they can be directed to the places that can give their loved one and their families help. I wanted to, I think we have, if we have some questions from the audience, I think we have a, a microphone maybe. Where did Michael go? Do we, oh, there he is. Did we have a, a, any questions from the audience? There's one right here. Is there any research done on, I mean, 40 hours of training, you know, and you go for a whole year and you're on the street. Is there any research done about repeat having, you know, some kind of accountability, like what I'm remembering quiz or something? I mean, it's obviously 40 hours in a year, and continuing education kind of idea is great, but any research done on exactly how many hours is the police track nothing, okay? That's why we're pushing for data collection. So yeah. if you look at Salt Lake PD's website, they've started tracking data, but I want the race, gender, and age of every person they pull over on their website to prove that they're racially profiling people. And what has it been? Two years, it's still not up there. Um, they don't track who they kill. They don't track who they kill in prisons. They don't track anything. So they're the most disorganized part yeah. of the government. Accountability is a huge thing. And to answer specifics, when we first started as coalition stepping in and examining exactly what the training was, I believe that at some point, like maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was a a requirement made that they have to have at least 40 hours for their entire career. <laughs> okay, that's it. But a lot of the older officers who had not received that training were grandfathered in, so they had never received it at all. So there was a lot to be left desired. And no research has been done in terms of how effective the training is and how often it needs to be uh, reinstated or you know, just quizzed on again. Who would determine effectiveness? Just like they determine that they're justified after they investigate themselves and find themselves innocent. Yeah, um, it's uh, who they let in to do that survey. That's a problem, yeah. It's a huge problem, and I believe uh, D to C actually brought that to the forefront um, last year and that is many officers um, are afraid to bring it forward because they don't want to get fired. So we discussed at a few, I think three different meetings, um, where how can we create a situation for officers to feel safe to step forward and say, hey, I've got PTSD. We still haven't had anything hit the table for any resolved effort on that, but it has been discussed. I think we had a question at the very top. Um, yes, three quick points. I wanted to say, for them to justify Dante, Dante Hamilton's murder because he was mentally ill, that officer had no idea that he was mentally ill. He could have been sick, he could have been injured, he could have fainted, that's just ridiculous. And I'm a practicing attorney and we do have 
massive continuing education requirements that we must fulfill. And you have to record them, and you have to attend, or you get this bar. And to require the police to do that is the same as every other profession out there. Doctors have it, accountants have it, lawyers have it, police should have it, no question. But I also think it's important that people understand that part of the accountability here is to vote people out. And, you know, I went to the protest, I think Black Lives Matter hosted this. Was it Patrick Carmen who was murdered? Shot yes. in the back, unarmed, on his bicycle. And Sam Gill did nothing. And we must vote out people like Sam Gill. And when we do it, we must tell them that we are voting them out because their police officers murder innocent people. I've been thinking about Sam for a minute. You know, I've been thinking about Sim because Sim always tells us, hey, if an officer fears for their life, then, then they have, you know, then they can shoot someone. And, you know, if you fear for your life, go work in a bakery. Um, but, but Sim always puts it on us. Sim says, you need to change the law. And I said, well, Sim, can you, can you prosecute? Can you take it to trial? And he said, I could, but I probably won't win. And to me, that's cowardice. And to me, that's not accountability. And to me, that is him not following through and getting the Democrat vote no matter what he does. Um, he doesn't prosecute cops. He prosecutes less than 1% of police in this state. And there comes a point where we do need to think about Sim because, you know, I think I'll meet with him. I think my next protest will be at his offices. And, and I'm, I'm honestly thinking, should, should we vote Sim out? And that, that's a question that, no, there could be somebody worse. S yeah, worse. So we have to really think about it, and we have to really decide if we're going to vote Sim out. But I'm going to talk to him, I'm going to protest him, and then we need to decide if we're going to get rid of him. You cannot be <laughs> I agree. These yeah. people, these men that were shot in the back, Patrick Carmen, the gentleman at the end of this film, you cannot, it, under the law, be in fear for your life legally if the person is running away and you're shooting them in the back. I agree. The has got to go. I agree. And we also, and I have said this, I am praying for our younger generations to step up to the plate and take these positions as officers and people of power who have the ability to prosecute. We need to find people who have, what's the word, the gumption? Courage. The courage to actually do what's right. And we need people to step in to, we need, I mean, Sim Gill said at the town hall talks, system's broken. And I've said it before, even in protests through the megaphone, we need to clean house and start over. It's not working anymore. So, it, you know, we need to find people, we need people to guide our communities and protect our communities. But we can't just rely on people that don't have a college education filling out a employment form for a police officer who just want a job, and they'd rather pull a trigger so they can get home to dinner on time. Okay, we have one last question just in front. Uh, yes, I was going to say, one, uh, if a police officer is supposed to be protecting us, then they shouldn't be afraid because if you're afraid, then I want someone who's willing to actually take a bullet for me as a citizen. And uh, then I just, I, as a person with disabilities, you know, a lot of police officers, they don't have uh, medical degrees. They don't, it's not like they go through to get medical training at all. They, you know, some people, you know, if a cop tells you to hold your hands up, some people can't hold their hands up for very long, or there's a lot of situations, 
and I believe that cops don't have medical degrees, they have killing degrees. I 100% agree. We've been down to the precinct with the coalition, and we've seen the training. Um, it's a cookie cutter training. There's a lot of virtual reality rooms where you're looking at a screen with headphones and eyeglasses on and a gun, and you're being put under a pressure cooker. And nine times out of 10, from what I could see, the correct answer to that virtual reality situation is to pull the trigger. They didn't take us to the de-escalation training. <laughs> I sure would have liked to gone to that, but they didn't take us yet. I just want to say, Adam, you're right. And, and we hear a lot from people with disabilities that they get harassed. I mean, obviously, we saw the video of Salt Lake PD dumping a girl out of her wheelchair at the road home. Um, but I just, if this is our last thing, I just want to stress that um, Black Lives Matter, we don't care if you have a criminal record a mile long. Black men deserve to make it to court. Um, you know, it's watching this film, it just re-traumatizes me because Heidi and I live in Groundhog Day. Um, an officer pulls a trigger, the media dehumanizes the person, pulls a criminal record before the body is cold to justify the killing. Homeless. Um, yeah, you know, the, the police lie in their report. Um, they, you know, Sim Gill doesn't press charges. Um, the, the officers release the body cam footage. We find out the truth, more protests. Um, the, the family sues the police department. The police settle out of court. They learn nothing. Um, Officer Fox, who killed Patrick Harmon, is still on the street carrying a service weapon out to kill again. Um, and James and Barker's killer is still on the street. It just happens. Officer Matthew Taylor, he's still walking a beat. You know. Yeah. It never ends. It continues over and over again. And, and we are going to stop it. And it starts in Utah. And Heidi and I meet with the police every two weeks. Um, Utah Against Police Brutality is, is going to pass that piece of legislation. Black Lives Matter is going to pass our piece of legislation. Um, that's going to be a state piece of legislation. After I pass that, I'm taking it national. We're going to regulate and, and, these yeah. things. Thank you. Vote people in the office. They'll make the change. OK, well, let me tell you a little bit about the NAACP since I didn't at the beginning there. Uh, we have, uh, were founded in 1909. Or a civil rights organization, and our mission uh, is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate racial hatred and racial discrimination. Uh, we do not endorse uh, any political candidate, and so we want to make that very clear. And so we want to thank everybody for being here this evening and for watching and for the panelists' participation. Uh, thank you and good night.